Welcome to Washington Legal Foundation's webinar. My name is Glenn Lammy. I am uh, executive director and head of legal studies here at the foundation. For those of you not familiar with the foundation, we are in our 45th year of free enterprise advocacy and education. Uh, we're sort of a public interest law firm plus a uh, legal think tank. Um, if you want to spend some time at WLF.org to learn a little bit more about us, that would be great. Uh, we're really pleased to have you with us today and, and uh, look forward to, uh, I think, an interesting discussion on a, on a really interesting topic. So this is the third program in a series of webinars WLF is hosting under the theme of taking the initiative on IP litigation. So each program has been a WLF moderated discussion on different businesses and industries use of strategic litigation, voluntary agreements, and other proactive initiatives to safeguard their intellectual property. In addition to intellectual property protection, the actions our speakers have discussed in the first two programs also safeguarded public or consumer safety. So for instance, in the first program, uh, we addressed 3M and its attorney's efforts to combat counterfeiting and profiteering of N95 masks during the, during the pandemic. The second program addressed piracy of online content, uh, of online entertainment content. And as our speakers explained, Websites that traffic in pirated content frequently expose consumers to malware and other tools that threaten their devices and privacy. Today's installment expands our discussion of how property rights infringement can lead to public health threats into the world of packaged foods and their famous brands. Let me introduce our speakers quickly. Sorry. Stacey Papadopoulos is General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Operations and Initiatives for the Consumer Brands Association. She currently serves as Interim CEO. She previously served as General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Industry Services at the American Gaming Association. Prior to that, as a corporate attorney focusing on corporate governance, risk management, securities disclosure, executive compensation, and nonprofit law. Andrew Klein is a uh, senior counsel to Perkins Coie, practicing in the firm's Denver, Colorado office. He's co-chair of the firm-wide cannabis industry group, responsible for matters involving almost all aspects of cannabis law and policy. He has a vast background of experience uh, through 15 years as federal prosecutor, policy advisor to then Vice President Biden, counsel to then Senator Biden, Senator Biden and service in the Federal Enforcement Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission. We are recording today, and if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. And Stacy, I will turn it over to you. Sure. Let me just share my screen. Can you see that? Can you guys? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Glenn. Thanks for creating this series and putting a spotlight on this important consumer protection issue. I thought in the next, I'd take 10 minutes or so to kind of set the stage, uh, summarize the issue, share some notable trends, some studies, statistics that we've seen, and then summarize the activities and progress um, that, that at least I've seen um, over the last 18 months. So, Make sure I'm going to look down because my my uh, slides are down to just make sure they're moving. Um, so just a just a, a note on Consumer Brands Association. So we're a trade association that represents the consumer packaged goods industry. And so what that means um, to people not in the industry is if you think about all the grocery products you find um, uh, in that store. Uh, we represent uh, 2,000 iconic brands. Some of them are on the screen. Um, what we did was about 18 months ago, we formed a task force that was committed to raising awareness and finding solutions to combat the growing threat to health and safety posed by copycat THC edibles. And what, why we formed this task force, we did it for three reasons. First was um, 
the brands were experiencing an alarming increase in the number of consumers, members of law enforcement, media, contacting them about products that looked just like their own products, um, but were making kids sick. Second, the traditional trademark infringement tools that they had available to them were ineffective to address this issue. It had become really a game of whack-a-mole. And then finally, the brand owners knew that they could be a resource and had um, important information to share with others who were better positioned to take action, particularly those in law enforcement. So what the task force agenda is, and, and at Consumer Brands, we're, we're really trying to advance that, um, is to raise awareness, um, things like this are great, um, extend outreach to those that can really help us combat the problem, um, and then assess uh, what's needed. Uh, those can be solutions, expanding some of the tools. I know we might get into some of the legislation we pursued recently, but what can we do to really tackle this issue? Um, so let me start uh, with the problem itself. What are we talking about here? So copycat THC edibles are edible THC products that mimic well-known brands, those that you and I know and trust, but you really shouldn't because these products are made by bad actors, they're mislabeled, and they're being consumed in greater numbers by kids that are being tricked into um, eating them. So if you look at this screen, um, and this picture is actually from an event um, that the AG in Virginia um, had, did over the, the summer. And these were products that were just um, collected going up and down uh, uh, 95 for those of us um, in the DC area. And so the only way to really tell the difference sometimes between these copycat products and the real thing is in the corner, there may be you know, a small THC lettering or the wrapper may be a little shinier than what um, you would find a typical bag of chips or box of cereal in. Um, and they're really minimal distinctions that children often miss because they can't read or they're just not even familiar with the, the concept of a copycat. And, and so that is leading to the headlines that you see on the screen. And we have even though I'd say awareness of this issue has been um, growing, uh, so have the, these headlines. Um, so this situation continues to really intensify and not uh, just two weeks ago, and not on the screen, um, was a headline, and it said, Virginia mother charged with murder after four-year-old son dies from eating THC gummies. So we're now, you know, moving from just sickness into real deaths, and just being, again, again in the D.C. area, I saw just this week, um, Several students at a Fairfax County middle school were sickened after exposure to uh, Delta-8 candies and three were hospitalized. So that was just another um, headline uh, just in, in the area where I live. These packages, both the empty wrappers and the final products are turning up um, with hardcore drugs and guns. So this is definitely becoming something uh, of a new line of business for organized crime. It doesn't take any creativity or really um, much cash to start up in this business. And I'll get into that in a moment, but you'll, you're will you just seeing um, really bad actors really getting involved and that's that's really accelerating um, kind of the, the, the impact. So not surprisingly, you can't trust what you also see in these uh, packages. There've been a couple of, of NYU studies and one of them uh, found rampant mislabeling. Uh, the study revealed that in a typical copycat um, uh, package, 
there were there were there was on average 459 milligrams of THC, which is far greater than typically 100 milligrams, where you see uh, that limit in states where uh, marijuana is legal. I think the other thing that we noticed we we had a um, a bunch of our member companies um, in town uh, talking to some of the the federal agencies, and they had um, you know just some of the the copycat packages themselves. And, you know, the other unfortunate thing for, um, you know, consumers, um, we'll call them consumers, is that uh, even the packages, so your nutrition facts panel, that panel that you usually see serving size, sugar, whatever, fal calories, fat, um, tends to be a duplicate of the real thing. So it may say like in this example, 600 milligrams of THC, but on the, the back, uh, it will be a copy of the actual product. So it might say, you know, the one bag is a serving size or, you know, it, it doesn't speak to the actual servings of, of THC, which is creating even more um, potential harm. That's leading to uh, the statistics that you see on the screen. Um, so in June, FDA warned consumers about the risk to children po posed by these copycat edibles. These statistics are just for the first five months of the year. Um, and I still think they're, they're the best ones out there because they get at um, you know unintentional exposures, age of those exposed. But what they found was just through May, over 10,000 people had gotten sick. The vast majority uh, were young people who consumed the products unintentionally. And over 80% of those cases uh, required some kind of medical in intervention. So that, that one is not on the screen, but that means they had to call a doctor, go to the emergency room, um, you know, seek, seek some kind of medical attention. Uh, I saw another statistic recently uh, from uh, the state of Florida. They had already through um, uh, October, I think it was through the end of September, had 500 poison control calls for exposures to children five and under. So um, definitely uh, a growing, growing harm. Um, what we've also unfortunately seen over the last, you know, six months to a year is uh, this trend, this copycat um, uh, pattern moving into serious, you know, hardcore drugs like fentanyl. And these uh, pictures are from a, a recent um, AG advisory. So that that is kind of a sum of the, the problem. Uh, in a nutshell, I think the the before I turn it back to you, um, Glenn, uh, a couple of things that I wanted to point out is uh, maybe three things. One is I wanted to focus your attention on the online aspect of this problem. Um, these packages, these uh, are mostly manufactured abroad. Um, and they are readily and inexpensively available for purchase online. And so that makes it incredibly easy for a bad actor to start a business in this area. Um, so any solution has to uh, address this online aspect. I think the second thing that I would point out is the international component. So a lot of these just, we're just talking packages are manufactured abroad, primarily in China, then they're sold online and they, they get into the US and they're then filled with either adulterated actual product or you know whatever the, the, the person wants to put uh, in them. And then the final, I think, piece, which I touched on earlier, is that given that global supply chain, the involvement of criminal networks and uh, the sale online, is that traditional brand policing activities are no longer effective. And I know we're going to get into that a little bit more uh, later. So what have we been went, been doing as an industry, as an association? Um, I'm going to just spend the next maybe minute or two summarizing uh, where we are. Um, so consumer brands uh, started building a network primarily 
uh, through uh, outreach to law enforcement because this was a really you know impactful partner to have both in terms of the bully pulpit um, but also in terms of you know deterrence and prosecution so we started uh, with law enforcement state AGs have been really good partners um, federal agencies we're working uh, closely with DHS um, Homeland Security investigations uh, we've had you know several conversations at this point with um, FDA. And then we've had some proactive um, outreach from local law enforcement, um, DEA, and, and some other agencies. Uh, we've also um, expanded outreach and, and um, you know, uh, gotten in touch um, through through this issue with groups like Andrews and the regulated cannabis industry, um, some of the online platforms, and then also um, consumer groups that are interested uh, in the issue. And so what what are we, you know, again, trying to um, do? Uh, and I think we have really uh, done this first thing uh, well at this point, grow public awareness. I think there's really good um, momentum with law enforcement on the end game, uh, uh, making sure that people are aware of this issue, um, beginning to attack the issue. Uh, what we'd like to see more is um, attacking the issue at the source and the source being kind of online. And I think we have some really good um, law enforcement partners working with us on that. Um, again, uh, using the brand owners and consumer brands as um, a resource for this. We've created a, an actionable toolkit for advocacy and enforcement. And if anyone's interested in that, um, I'm happy to share that. And then finally, uh, working to expand available tools. Well, I know we're going to get in, into some of this in the Q&A, but how can we um, have the right tools to, to address the solution? And I'm, I just wanted to point out, again, the, the excellent work and progress we've made with state AGs. They sent a letter um, uh, a couple of months ago to Congress asking, um, calling on Congress to think creatively on this. So more to come on that. We we are planning to you know go back to the hill probably after the midterms. But those are some of the things that we have been doing over the last you know year year and a half um, on this topic. And so that I'm going with that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Stacey, for setting the table for our discussion uh, with that excellent presentation. So when the use of copyright, copycat packaging and resulting accidental consumption really started to arise, Andrew, how did the legitimate cannabis product manufacturers industry react sort of initially? Thanks, Glenn. Um, and first, before I answer your question, I just want to commend um, Stacy for her, her leadership on this issue. It's, it's super important. And I know she's been front and center and um, just want to acknowledge her hard work here. Um, you know, I guess I'd describe it as sort of moderate alarm. Um, as Stacy laid out, there are sort of two big problems posed by these products. You know, one is IP infringement, and two is the risk to public health and, and safety. Um, on the IP side, nobody in the cannabis industry wants to be in the crosshairs of Stacy's members, um, for sure. And no one wants to be dragged into federal court. And everyone I know thinks that IP theft is just plain wrong. Um, as you'll hear, you know, shortly, uh, this is a problem uh, from from the illicit market side. There are sort of two sides of the cannabis industry: the legal, um, state regulated side of the industry, and the illegal side. And, and we'll talk about more of that later. But the biggest problem, I think, is the risk to public health and safety, and that what that means to the state legal cannabis industry. Um, because there are companies that are producing these hemp derived products that are exploiting loopholes in the 2018 Farm Bill. And the proliferation of these products, in my view, and I'm sure in Stacy's, is, um, and, and certainly the companies that I'm talking to, uh, is a clear and present danger to the state regulated market because, you know, one, one child gets hurt from these illegal uh, products and everyone points their finger at the state legal industry and it's game over. Um, so, you know, companies are working through their respective trade associations 
um, which is great. But the problem is that there are, there are dozens of state trade associations throughout the country, uh, cannabis related state trade associations and a handful of federal trade associations. Some are doing work on this, some are not. Um, you know, for instance, I know the California um, State Trade Association just released a white paper recently um, and did some really good work. Um, but, you know, some states, state associations have said nothing. And so the challenge, I think, for the cannabis industry is get everyone and getting everyone on the same page and rowing in the same direction. And that's just generally not that easy in cannabis. Thank you. Um, you mentioned states, and certainly some states have legalized recreational use of cannabis. Um, when that was done, did any put into place laws or regulations that dictated what could and couldn't be put on cannabis packages, um, generally speaking? Yeah, and and you know those packaging and labeling requirements are significant. Um, um, all of those rules, but there's some limited consistency across the states on those uh, rules and regulations. Um, and most of those packaging requirements or labeling requirements that exist in the state legal cannabis industry don't apply to hemp products. Um, there are also no national standards um, at all. And so you've got this sort of patchwork of, of state laws throughout 38 states, um, which makes it hard for, for companies to comply and people to understand. Um, you know, some of the packaging and labeling rules that uh, that are in the states are, are specifically there to protect children. So those include, you know, disallowing things like cartoons or um, prohibitions on imitating candy products or frankly, anything appealing to children. Um, and then, you know, most states require THC and CBD content. Uh, they require that there be no false or misleading information. Uh, they require information about health risks, uh, tracking information or, you know, SKU numbers, cannabis symbols, impairment disclaimers, and, you know, lots of other things. But again, there's no uniformity. Um, and, you know, I, we'll talk about this, I'm, I'm sure, as we get into uh, this conversation. But from my perspective, the best solution is going to be for everyone to deschedule marijuana and to develop a national regulatory framework with national standards for both marijuana and hemp derived products, uh, because it's really important uh, at the end of the day that we we safely regulate these products so that um, people are not producing products that appeal to children and kids don't have access and aren't getting sick. Um, I, I recently published a white paper on standardizing uh, lab testing. And, you know, from my perspective, the same thing needs to be done with packaging and labeling. We should have national standards. <clears throat> Um, you had talked about, or um, Stacy had mentioned uh, during her presentation, Delta-8 THC. Um, can you explain how those products are different from other THC-based edibles and sort of what their legality status is? I think there's a lot of confusion about that out there. Yeah, there should be a lot of confusion. Um, it's really complicated. Um, and Glenn, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that one slide, I'll... Uh, folks can kind of just see the side by side as I'm trying to explain this, but, um, you know, people disagree on the legality of, of Delta eight. Let me just say that up front, but he, here are the basics. Um, marijuana and hemp are basically the same plant. The marijuana and its derivatives remain federally illegal, but state legal in 38 state markets. I think everyone probably knows that. Um, those, those products, those marijuana products contain Delta-9 THC um, and Delta-9 THC derived from marijuana. Um, on the hemp side, Congress uh, descheduled hemp, legalized hemp in the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, and there they created this artificial distinction that separates hemp from marijuana. And that distinction is exclusively based on the Delta-9 THC concentration in those products. So Delta-9 is the molecule that gets you high in marijuana. Um, Delta-8 is the molecule that gets you high from, uh, from hemp, hemp-derived products. Um, so the 2018 Farm Bill legalized hemp-derived products as long as they don't test above 0.3% Delta-9 THC on a dry weight basis. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second, but um, the bill, the farm bill was silent on other forms of THC like Delta-8. 
So Delta A, T, and C can be produced from hemp. It's also intoxicating, just like Delta 9, not quite as intoxicating, but it is intoxicating. Um, so what's happening is that there are loopholes in the federal definition of hemp that are being exploited by hemp product manufacturers to sell untested, unsafe, unregulated, potent intoxicant, intoxicants without age verification. I mean, it's just alarming in gas stations, in convenience stores, online. And I guarantee you that when Mitch McConnell supported the 2018 Farm Bill, he didn't think that he was legalizing unregulated hemp-derived intoxicating products. That, that was not what's going on in his head. So the Farm Bill left some gaps, um, but the federal regulators have also been less than clear on their view of the legality of these hemp-derived intoxicating products. So, you know, you look at what the DEA has said and done in response to the passage of the Farm Bill, the DEA issued an interim final rule in 2020 indicating that uh, synthetic cannabinoids remain scheduled, uh, but they didn't define what that means. What, what does synthetic mean? Um, and some people in some states, frankly, believe that Delta-8 uses a synthetic process um, converting CBD into Delta-8 through heat and pressure. Um, others disagree. Others think that, that, you know, that a plant-based medicine made from hemp or marijuana can't possibly be synthetic, right? They think when they think synthetic, they think of a person in a, in a white um, lab coat, you know, in a, in a beaker. Um, and, you know, some states have, 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 have looked at this and I'll talk about that in a minute, but later um, in September of 2021, I believe, uh, DEA wrote a letter to the Board of Pharmacies after an inquiry about Delta-8, sort of implying that Delta-8 was lawful. Um, and they based that opinion pretty much exclusively on that 0.3% Delta-9 THC threshold. But that was a non-binding policy statement. It was just a letter. Um, and it also left that synthetic argument that I mentioned open. It didn't, didn't really address that, although in a footnote, I think it said that synthetics are still illegal. So we don't really know what the DEA's you know, final view is on whether one of these products would be considered synthetic or not. Um, but um, I think the FDA's guidance has been a little bit clearer. So in September of 2021, the FDA published a consumer update warning uh, consumers of the risk of these products. But then notably in May of 2022, they sent warning letters indicating that Delta-8 products are unapproved new drugs, they're misbranded, and they're unapproved uh, as food additives. Um, and you know the FDA was clearly concerned about everything that, that Stacey was just talking about, the appeal to children, the intoxicating offense, effects and the number of reported adverse events um, to poison control centers and, and others. And so from my perspective, like what's abundantly clear here is that FDA thinks Delta-8 is illegal, no question. Um, and, you know, if that doesn't confuse you enough, you know, look at the states, you know, many states like Oregon believe that Delta-8 is a synthetic and make it illegal for that particular reason. Some states have outlawed it because it's intoxicating, states like California. Um, and let me just flag one other issue here. Um, you know, Delta-8 is intoxicating, but unlike marijuana, there are no federal limits or there are no limits, sorry, on how much you can put in a package. So like in the state of California, you can only put, you know, I think it's um, uh, 100 milligrams, you know, 10 milligrams per piece. And that's that in and of its in and of itself. I'm sorry, a Delta nine, um, and that in and of itself is super scary because there's literally just no one regulating the amount of of intoxicants that can be put in a Delta eight uh, package. But there's another hemp related problem that's really significant, and that is that I, I've talked a little bit about um, 0.3 percent on a dry weight basis, and you know once you start adding. Delta nine that's been derived from hemp um, to a product um, like a chocolate or something heavy, um, you can end up with a lot of THC in a product. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that in California, you're limited to 10 milligrams of, of Delta nine per serving. That's a lot for a grown adult. I guarantee you that anyone on this call that took a 10 milligram gummy probably wouldn't be able to work for the rest of the day. Um, or, or um, you know, at least not not in the way you, you'd want to. So, you know, the farm bill allows for that 0.3% Delta 9 in the final product, and there's no cap 
on the per package amount for those hemp products. So if you have two gummies weighing, you know, six grams, you could have almost 18 milligrams of, of THC in that product. Or for one cookie weighing 16 grams, you could have 48 milligrams of THC. Um, for a beverage, you know, that might weigh 340 grams, you could have over a thousand milligrams of THC. So for the unregulated hemp industry, you can basically have a hundred times more THC than what's allowed in the regulated cannabis market. Um, this is just a public health and safety ticking time bomb from my perspective. Thank you for explaining that intro. It's definitely very complicated. Um, Stacey, let's talk a little bit more about the engagement of stakeholders um, that, that CBA has been going through. Uh, has that been effective, you think, in, in helping to get the word out and, and to, to sort of sharpen your, your advocacy and education tools? I think so. Um, so one, one thing I would point out is that we have um, ex, uh, extended membership in our own task force to companies that aren't members of consumer brands. So we've included um, just because we think it's such an important public uh, safety issue that we've, uh, for the purposes of this issue, we are allowing um, brands that are not um, consumer brands members to join. And so um, to your point, we're trying to, um, you know, make sure that when we connect with other uh, critical parties, they know, you know, that we are really trying to represent this issue in, in its entirety. And I'd say, you know, our first call was to law enforcement and we, um, you know, had a very positive, supportive um, relationship with them, which is, is great to see. Um, I think we have really good momentum. And I think that over the next, hopefully six to 12 months, you're going to see the the fruits of that relationship, um, you know, come uh, come to bear when when you, we see some more like I think prosecutions or actions in the space. Um, I think the other thing that uh, that has been successful is it's brought groups like Andrew um, to us. Uh, um, and and others that can be um, kind of like a, a, a magnifier of our message, um, just local, you know, local groups, law enforcement, how do we effectively, you know, deal with others. So that part has all been um, great. I think the other thing that you're really seeing is um, both on the, you know, the solution side. So how do we expand the tools we need? We had the, you know, great AG letter and support. We have a legislative coalition that includes a broad um, group uh, behind us on those solutions. And I think the other thing that has been um, great to see from my perspective is even the willingness of law enforcement to collaborate across state, you know, across state lines and then federal to state, which, you know, to Andrew's point, there, there's this is a lot of patchwork. And the more coordinated um, education and even um, intelligent sharing you can do, I think the, the more um, effective we can all be. So I think um, to answer that, that question, Glenn, I think uh, we have really seen some success and momentum on this issue. And so you feel pretty strongly, Andrew, about the collaboration that, that, that the cannabis industry has engaged in so far? And, and uh, you know, where do you see that, that part of the, the coalition going in the next year or so? You know, I, I think... Um... I think there have been some groups that have engaged uh, with stakeholders that U.S. Cannabis Council certainly has. And, you know, I, I want to commend the leadership of Michelle Fanning from Canopy and Jen Flanagan from VS Strategy, VS Strategy on, on this issue. Um, you know, the U.S. Cannabis Council engage, has engaged with, with Stacy's organization and the confectioners and the AG Alliance and some individual consumer packaged good companies. Um, and I know that they are contemplating next steps. I'd love to see, you know, and as I said earlier, I know the California uh, State Trade Association has been engaged. So I'd love to see some of the other trade associations um, stepping up because this is, this is, as I, I mean, I'm going to keep saying this, this is a clear and present danger to the state regulated market. Um, 
it, 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 from my perspective, you know, next to legalization and safe banking, it's, it is the most important issue that anybody could be focusing on. Um, on the hemp industry side, it seems pretty fractured to me. Um, the U.S. Hemp Authority issued a statement saying that they would no longer certify hemp products that were marketed for intoxicating effects like Delta-8. Um, but the Hemp Industries Association released a, a white paper indicating that Delta-8 is legal and that it's non-synthetic. And um, so, you know, it's, it's not really clear to me where the hemp industry is on this issue. I, I, uh, I, I wish that people were coming out and saying, you know, if you're if you're producing intoxicating products that uh, they should be regulated um, and that you shouldn't be infringing on anyone's IP, particularly um, IP that is attractive to children. It's just, it's horrific conduct. So Stacey, which particular federal agencies are, are most engaged on this? You've talked a lot about the state AGs, but certainly there, there's, I, I would imagine a, a federal role of some sort here also. Sure. Um, so when you look at um, kind of the issue, as I explained, explained it, like some of the source of this packaging is both readily and inexpensively available online, and it's coming um, mostly from abroad. So um, the the agency that you know we went to right away was um, DHS and they have Homeland Security Investigations. It's kind of like their um, you know, enforcement arm. And so we've been uh, working with them. They have an IPR center, which you know, groups like yours, Glenn, may be familiar with. So that, that's where we have, they have taken on kind of a coordinating role within um, federal agencies and have, uh, we see, we've seen them and we actually just had a, a really great call with some of the state AGs and, um, you know, HSI uh, about how, you know, they can potentially work together, share information. So that's the group um, that we've been working most, uh, I think, directly with. And the other obvious group and, you know, just consumer brands and all of the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis, we have a really, you know, strong relationship with FDA. I'd say on this issue, they have not been as proactive as we would like. I think it you know, to all the issues that Andrew talked about, um, you know, I think they're trying to figure out how um, to have a federal framework. And so I think, you know, uh, we are working with them on, on, on how we can give them uh, the information they need to hopefully be a little more proactive on the issue. So we're, we're talking more to them. I would point out that they do have a really good FAQ on this issue that, that kind of makes um, the uh, kind of the THC and CBD as an, any, anytime you add that to a food product, it is adulterated. And so if you go to their website and, and you look up um, the FAQs on marijuana, you'll find that. And so that's a good, another good legal point in addition to what Andrew talked about. One of the things that you mentioned during your presentation, Stacey, was the role of organized crime in this. And, and that's one of the things that really, I was surprised to hear about from our last webinar with the motion picture industry as to how engaged organized crime is in the area of, of, uh, of online content piracy. Um, that, that sort of calls out for a federal role as, as well, um, as well as coordination between federal and state when it, when it comes to dealing with organized crime. If you, if is there anything you can tell us about, about what's going on there? I mean, that, that part, I'm just, I'm just following, you know, the news like, like, uh, others, but when you, um, you know, there's there's a gray area, and I think some um, uh, some policymakers uh, and others um, think, you know, what's what's the harm in marijuana, right? Like, um, but the harm is really that without um, consistent uh, kind of regulations, especially when it comes to things that people are ingesting or putting on their body, if you think of all of the the, the regulations and inspections and testing and everything that goes into all of the products you see and use, and none of that exists in these other things. Um, I think the, the more people really 
think through that part, um, the more more disturbed they'd be. So when you talk about a gray area that 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 is not um, a real focus of, um, you know, I guess some you know enforcement and understanding and then you have a ready supply a cheap and ready supply that you can anonymously purchase online uh, you know it's it's just an easy business i think for organized crime but that's that's just me following the headlines i don't i don't know intro in, in addition to i'm sorry go ahead you're gonna say something i was just gonna ask if i could respond um, yes of course as you said um I think Stacy's exactly right. I just want to make sure that people understand that there are, we're talking about two different marketplaces. We're, we're talking about a state legal marijuana marketplace in 38 states where we have, you know, uh, testing, we have packaging and labeling requirements, we have age verification requirements, we have security requirements. The cannabis industry is very well regulated, and we have extremely re responsible actors out there producing high quality products, um, you know. Uh, that are safe. Um, of course, you don't want you know children to ever have access to those products. But um, here, what we're talking about are hemp derived products where there are no regulations at all, and you know that that's where the problem lies. Is is you know we need products like this to be regulated, whether it's by the state or the federal government, to make sure that they are safe. As to, to Stacy's point, you know when you go into a grocery store. And you buy a head of lettuce, you're pretty certain you're not going to get E. coli because the FDA has examined or you know inspected products in, in that store. And you know the same should go for for cannabis products. And by the way, like there's no um, legal cannabis product that you can buy online and have it shipped to you, um, you know, by UPS. So like if you're if you're getting on Amazon or not Amazon, but if you're getting on you know some random website and you're ordering a, a delta eight product um online and they're mailing it to you you can be pretty pretty well assured that it's not legal uh, what i was going to actually ask andrew is somewhat related to that which is that that in, in addition to using branded companies trademarks these products are often mislabeled in terms of how much thc they even have correct yep yeah so that's, that's yeah, i mean that you know that's the the conundrum right with testing because when you require testing, um, you know, you, you, you get an accurate result and then you put that on the label and there are state regulators making sure that those labels are accurate. Uh, when you don't have testing and you don't have labeling requirements, then all bets are off. Right. And I know so we... Really I'm sorry, go ahead. Right. Uh, I know we were going to, you know, mention this, but I, I, th I do think if you look at what uh, Virginia has done recently on this issue, that is a good um, kind of model for what states could be doing at their level, you know, absent this this federal framework. I think it really does a good job of, of you know, talking through, you know, the labeling aspect, the testing aspect, the under it, you know, the packaging. They, I think they get at it at a bunch of different angles. And I think they also really do a nice job of coordinating um, from a regulatory and an enforcement um, through the AG's office perspective. So um, I don't, we don't have to, you know, get into that issue in particular, but if someone was looking for a, a framework, I think that's um, a good one I've seen. Thank you for, for offering that. Um, looking at the legislative level that you sort of alluded to a little bit ago, Stacey, um, this year, consumer brands and a coalition of companies and, and associations pushed for an amendment to the Federal Shop Safe Act in the context of copycat packaging and sales. Why was that amendment needed and, and, and are, are your efforts gonna continue on that front? Sure. And so I, I think that gets at one of the questions I saw in the chat had to do with, like, could you talk more about the, the whack-a-mole nature of this problem? So when you think about kind of traditional infringement action, so you would, you know, usually send a cease and desist letter that assumes that the party on that side is a, you know, like a, a, a reasonable kind of usually corporate party that's going to respond. What do you, what do you do when, you know, you send these cease and desist letters and they, you know, get ripped up or, you know, the, the site that, that you're dealing with is, um, you know, clearly illegal. Like how do you even purchase as a good, you know, corporate actor? Like how do you even purchase that product to find out more? There's just so many different challenges when you're dealing with um, kind of these 
pop up the pop up nature of both the online presence, the parties that are selling that are hidden through, you know, shell companies. I think those traditional infringement tools of, you know, trademark or trade dress and, um, you know, getting an injunction or even, you know, mon you know monetary, um, some, mon you know, some money, it's not going to make up for all of the investigative dollars and everything that you spend. And so the, the whack-a-mole nature, um, you know, comes to bear when you're just looking at this landscape, right? And it's just, all the, these online actors that even when you work with um, some of the platforms to take down, then they pop back up, right? They're, you know, they're, they're creative too. They can, you know, change the, you know, the search terms or their company, you know, and so you're always kind of dealing with people that are moving. And so you're, you're expending all of these resources to fight something that is not likely to just end in a resolution that you can, you know, um, be satisfied with. So that that's kind of the, the whack-a-mole nature of it. And so what the Shop Safe Amendment sought to do is really expand the tools available to brand, you know, brand holders, which, and hold the online um, platforms accountable for their role in the problem. In other words, um, you know, they all can prioritize what is put on their platforms, take some greater responsibility. In fact, you know, some of the, the, the larger, you know, U.S. platforms have been great on this issue, right? They're working with us. We, over the last, you know, um, you know, year seen a huge difference in the numbers of listings, how quickly they get taken down, how proactive they are on this issue. And so ShopSafe was really to do that was to hold those online platforms, you know, accountable to a degree for what is on their site. And that's part of a probably a bigger um, issue, but in it was just on this specific health and safety issue. Um, and so uh, whether you know that vehicle exists or it's something standalone or it's with something else, I think that that will be um, you know, our federal affairs team and, and what they think makes sense. But that was the point of it is really to have um, them have you know some uh, our brands have some ability to address that online uh, aspect which is so important thank you um you sort of mentioned a little bit about the the infringement litigation that that companies like wrigley and hershey and ferrara have have, have brought um have those been successful at all and like you said there certainly is a whack-a-mole sort of aspect to it and and uh, they usually seek more to shut down the use of those those marks than they do for for damages, but uh, have have the company seen some success in in, in litigation from? Yeah, they they you know success you know in court and everything. Yes, um, they've I think um, typically been winning these, and and whether the outcome is an injunction or some kind of you know money or what whatever, but. Uh, I think what they're best for is, again, um, that brands will, you know, that they will stand up for public health and safety. Um, they will, you know, they will um, kind of raise the issue um, and say, make it clear that they're, they're not a, a part of this and that companies, you know, companies, actors, whomever that deal in this um, should watch out. So I think it, it, it sends um, a good message uh, you know, there, whether or not that, like, to the point of whether or not in the end, those are going to be the way to tackle this. I think it's, it's unlikely that alone will, you know, make a dent in this. Do you agree, Andrew, that it's, it's got to be a part of the strategy, but it can't be the only strategy. Right. Right. Litigation. Yeah. Sorry, are you asking me or Stacey? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, no, I totally agree with everything Stacy just said. I mean, you know, we just saw, you know, a successful lawsuit, I don't know, beginning at end of October with Ferrara um, in Florida. Um, and, you know, as you just said, Glenn, like this is whack-a-mole trying to just, you know, sue in court. And by the way, like 
not all of these dangerous um, hemp derived Delta eight products are IP infringing. So, you know, it's one thing to get a big consumer brand to sue based on IP infringement, but you know, the products are still dangerous, even if they're not infringing on someone's IP. And so, you know, you, you have to find another way to sue them <clears throat> in court. And, you know, as Stacey was just saying, yeah, it's, it's whack-a-mole. And what we really need is a legislative fix, whether it's in the farm bill or, or somewhere else, um, you know, on, uh, you know, and maybe, maybe there's, there's work to be done on the criminal side. I, I think, you know, criminal prosecutions tend to be a bigger deterrent for people. Um, if, if those penalties actually have teeth, I mean, I think people are generally more afraid to go to prison than they are to get sued. And so, um, you know, it would be great to see people who, who are selling to children or, you know, making children sick um, be held accountable. Um, but, I, but principally, and, you know, I, I agree that this cannot just be the solution, like litigation cannot be the, the, the only solution. So, Andrew, are you and, and some of your clients concerned that all this might lead to unintended consequences in the sense that um, more restrictions on packaging design or the use of certain words or even to head towards a plain packaging mandate for for legal and, and, and lawfully produced and sold cannabis is that are, are there concerns that this may lead to to that I, I don't I don't think so because you know look the cannabis industry has got a number of concerns right now right are we going to have banking um, are we going to have payment processing? Are we going to have access to capital markets? Are we going to have legalization or rescheduling? Like lot, lots, lots going on. Um, and this, this is a really important issue, and it's a ticking time bomb that should keep everyone up at night. But you know, I think the cannabis industry sort of rightly focused on uh, the issues that I just mentioned. But to answer your your direct question from my perspective. I'm less concerned about additional labeling requirements. Like the cannabis industry can adjust to that if that's what's going to happen. But but again, you know, because they're they're always adjusting to new and updated regulations. But the the issue is not coming from the legal cannabis industry. The issue is coming from the unregulated, untested, unsafe, um, hemp derived Delta Eight market. Um, and so, you know adding new regulations to products that are already uh, tested and regulated heavily at the state level is not gonna solve that problem. Um, but look, I, I am concerned certainly that, you know, there's gonna be a child who, who uh, gets really sick or injured as a result of, of uh, eating one of these packages that look like they're candy. And it's gonna be impossible to unwind that damage for sure. Um, and, and at that point, people won't see or understand or appreciate the difference between the, the state legal market and the illicit market. We saw this play out, um, I don't know, it must have been three, maybe four years ago in that vape crisis where, you know, people were making vape cartridges in their garage, um, putting vitamin E acetate um, uh, in, the, in the product uh, to help with viscosity. And uh, people, you know, that vitamin E was coating people's lungs and, and people were, were not breathing and, and dying and getting sick. And, you know, people initially thought, oh my God, like, is this coming from the, the state legal market? It took, it took a while uh, to figure it out. And, but in truth, it was the illicit market. Literally, people were just making these things by themselves and selling them on the street. But, you know, for a period of time, that fact got lost on people. And so, um, you know, I, I worry about the unintended consequences, uh, you know, around public safety more than packaging and labeling. Right, right. Yeah, I, I was impressed by one of the uh, legal cannabis makers took the time in one of the one of the reports that were done about this to show how their product looks in comparison with uh, the illicit products and how they take care to make sure that everything's clearly labeled and and it's not overly attractive to children. So it's, it's, it's encouraging, I'm sure to, to you to have, have companies like that out there willing to, to show that they're different and distinguishing themselves from, from uh, what's not legal that's out there. Yeah. And there are, you know, I'll just add Glenn, like there are companies that are even in the cannabis industry that are even going further, right? Like mm -hmm. wild, you know, just released a, a package that's environmentally sound. Like they didn't have to do that. They did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, so I think, you know, by and large, what you see in the legal cannabis industry is people doing everything they can to comply with state law. 
So one of the questions that we always try to ask in these series is, is what have you learned as lawyers and as, as advocates um, from having to deal with this, this situation? And what other lessons do you think that, that can be passed on to other industries that are dealing with similar situations where they're, they're having to, to take action to protect their own IP and there are some public health implications here and there? Want me to go Sorry. first? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Um, so I think I, I touched on this before, but I, I think what's really, what I really learned is you kind of think, you know, there's a whole body of laws, right, to protect, you know, brands or protect health and safety. Um, but when you have uh, this kind of like novel approach or you involve the, you know, the illegal um, actors or even, you know, people that just don't even understand uh, the rules, it becomes a lot more complicated. And I think it's it's even magnified further by, you know, the online um, platforms, the kind of anonymous nature of these sales and things like that. And so what I would say um, is, is um, I think the constant kind of evolution of laws and regulatory frameworks to kind of address the uh, the the speed of con the consumer. I think everyone agrees here. This is where, uh, you know, products and, and things have gotten out ahead of, of law and of regulatory bodies. So how do we how do we move and work at the, the speed of the consumer? That's definitely a takeaway. And then I think the other thing, um, just to be biased as, as uh, someone from a trade association is there's strength in numbers, right? Um, knowing that you're you're not alone and that what's working for other companies and sharing that information and finding, you know, sympathetic ears in law enforcement and others. I think everybody we've approached really gets this idea and wants, I mean, gets the the harm and wants to help. And so um, I think those are the, the two takeaways for me. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, one takeaway for me is that we shouldn't need a public health disaster to convince people to stop stealing intellectual property and stop marketing to children, you know, intoxicating products to children like that just um, is, is a takeaway that is hard for me to really understand. Um, but the big takeaway uh, in terms of regulation is that, you know, I, at least on the cannabis side and the marijuana side and, 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 and on the hemp side too, it's been the States, um, you know, it's have been shining examples of how we can regulate these kinds of products while the federal government really has not done a lot yet. Um, you know, the States have proven time and time again uh, that they can be more responsive and more agile than the federal government. Um, and they're, they've really stepped up. Um, you know, the FDA warning letters are nice, but I don't know that it's really scaring anyone to, into submission. Um, I wish the federal government would, would figure out a way to come down harder on these IP infringing, intoxicating uh, products that are marketed to children that are completely unregulated, sold in gas stations and convenience stores without, you know, lab testing or age verification. Um, so, you know, I, I guess at the end of the day, I would say that we should commend the states, we should commend organizations um, like the Consumer Brands Association and, and Stacy, and you know, folks are out there fighting the good fight. But um, we need more. We, we need legislation and federal. Well, thank you both. Sorry, thank you both for joining us today, and everybody who viewed online. Uh, this program, as I said at the outset, has been recorded, so I will be putting up a, a link on the program page on our website, as well as on YouTube, if anybody got on late or has uh, know someone that wants to watch uh, it in its entirety. Um, thank you again for joining us, Stacey and Andrew. Thanks for having us, Glenn. Thanks for having us, Glenn.